Well, it's time for another Thursday devotional, and today we continue our study of the Apostles' Creed. Last week, we looked at the phrase in the Creed, He ascended to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And today, we're moving on to the next phrase, From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. So we're looking at that final judgment when the Lord Jesus Christ returns bodily and with glory and he judges both those who are alive, the quick, and those who have died, who will be resurrected that they might participate in the final judgment. So that's what we're thinking about today. You know, the Bible tells us about God's great mighty acts of both salvation and judgment. His mighty acts of salvation and judgment work together to bring glory to his name and redemption to his people and his creation. You, in some ways, could summarize the Bible as the story of three great cataclysmic judgments. So obviously the creed is is focusing our attention on the third judgment, but there are two other great cataclysmic judgments which are found in the pages of Holy Scripture. And so I want to think about each of these three judgments today as we reflect on this aspect of the creed. But first we're going to talk about judgment one, Uh, then we're going to talk about judgment three, which is the judgment which the creed speaks of, and then we'll close by coming back to the second cataclysmic judgment of Scripture. Well, the first great cataclysmic judgment of Scripture it's helpful for us to think about today is the flood that came upon the world in Noah's time. Now, I know that this is a challenging story for many people, or at least, you know, many adults. You know, you hear it in Sunday school, but as you get older and you uh, hear other kinds of ideas, it, it becomes challenging and you wonder about different aspects of the story. I mean, was the flood really universal? Uh, was there really a giant boat? Was the salvation of the various species of animals? What are we to think of all of that? Um, and I know that there are struggles. But my sense is, my understanding is, is that really... If we set this story aside, that it does great detriment to our faith. We're missing things that we we really do need to know. You know, it's interesting to observe that many cultures have preserved stories of cataclysmic floods. Uh, Native American tribes, African tribes, Babylonians, Sumerians. Flood stories show up in Incan myth and in Hindu writings. I mean, what are we to make of the near universal presence of these kind of flood stories? Now, some people would say it, it's just really there was this kind of genetic transmission. One culture passed the story to another culture, which changed it a little bit, which passed it to another. But I wonder if, if that makes a lot of sense, given the wide uh, geographic spread of these stories and the diversity of the cultures, which have these flood stories. I wonder if it really holds up over time, that idea. And then others would say that it's really just something that emerges out of kind of the subconscious uh, psychology of humanity, right? Water is emblematic of chaos and and danger and the secession of the flood, the the receding of the waters is the triumph of civilization over chaos and disorder. And I have some big reservations about that uh, view of the story as well. But there could be another option. What if the story of a cataclysmic flood is nearly universal because it represents a memory of a historical event? That, in fact, it affected, in some sense, all the peoples of the earth at some point in human history. And because of that, because of the historical reality of this cataclysmic judgment of God upon sinful humanity, the memory retained itself in diverse groups. What about that possibility? The basics of the story go like this. God created the world and humanity. Humanity rebelled against God, and that rebellion spread both quantitatively and qualitatively. Not only did sin go with humanity wherever they moved, it deepened and developed until we read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is a powerful statement in Scripture. This is a damning indictment of humanity. God was not willing to allow his creation to be decimated by human evil, so he determined to send a cataclysmic flood to wash human wickedness off the face of the earth. God's judgment, however, was not total. We find in Genesis 6-8 that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The focus then shifted to Noah's adventure with God, building an ark, 
summoning the animals, saving his family, surviving the flood. But it's important to say that Noah's salvation was not some kind of reward for good behavior. He wasn't someone who merited God's favor, his salvation, because he was such a great guy. We see that Noah was actually chosen to, by the Lord to be a type of savior figure. When Noah was born, his father Lamech had said this, This one will give us the rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. That's what Lamech said. So it was believed from his earliest days that Noah might have some type of redemptive or salvific function. Maybe even some thought that he would be the seed of the woman who crushes the head of the serpent in line with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. In 2 Peter 2, 5, Peter designated Noah a preacher or herald of righteousness. Given what we see in many places in Scripture, it has never seemed unreasonable to me to say that God would have spared whatever person threw themselves on his mercy and boarded Noah's ark. God would have spared them. Nonetheless, the judgment came. And Noah's story ended by revealing him ultimately to be a flawed redeemer. Upon exiting the ark, he offered a burnt offering to the Lord, which seems to be an indication that even he had sin for which he needed to atone and that he knew it, and that's why he offered the offering. The final story we have of Noah is an odd story of drunkenness and nudity, which you can follow through if you read the closing verses of the Noah tale. Many other acts of salvation and judgment follow this story, but there is never again a cataclysmic universal judgment quite of this nature. And so therefore we move on to the third of the great cataclysmic judgments, uh, one that follows in the pattern of the judgment against Noah, and it's the judgment that is revealed in Revelation chapter 20. This is that third great judgment of Scripture, that universal cataclysmic type judgment. All humanity, including all that ever lived, are brought before God's holy throne. Books are opened, and perfect justice is delivered. As it's written in Revelation 20, 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Those whose names were written in the book of life were admitted into the, into the new heaven and the new earth. So the apparatus of judgment here is not water, it's fire. Well, of course, the wise person who reads that story asks the crucial question, how can my name be written in the book of life? Or how can I know that my name is written in the book of life? And that leads us back to Revelation 3, 5, where the exalted Christ says this. He says, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Okay, great. You want to know that your name is written in the book of life? Jesus says you need to be he who overcomes. But how do we overcome? Well, let's go to Revelation 12, 11. We find that the brethren there in Revelation 12, 11 have overcome their accuser, the devil, because of the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That's what it says. We can then weave these threads together. If your hope is in the blood of the lamb, that's where your hope is, then your name will be found in the book of life. Because if you have your hope in the blood of the Lamb, the testimony of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done, the testimony of the, those who have overcome the accuser, if your hope is in Jesus, then you have overcome. And if you have overcome, then your name is certainly in the book of life, and you will persist in God's mercy at the great judgment pictured in Revelation 20 the blood of the lamb. Now that gets us to the second cataclysmic judgment in scripture. We, we often forget, we think about the first and the third, these great kind of universal judging events, but there is this judgment that happens between those points of time. The cross of Calvary is also a cataclysmic judgment, like the flood that precedes it and the great judgment which follows it. But here the judgment of God falls upon the spotless lamb of God the eternal Son of God incarnate. The judgment came upon him not because of anything he had done, but because of our rebellion against God. He willingly offered his life as an atoning sacrifice to cleanse all those who trust in him of their God-alienating righteousness, unrighteousness, their unrighteousness. Because judgment fell upon the Son, we who trust in Jesus need not fear the judgment to come. 
Noah found favor with God, but we discover that he was a failed redeemer. The story of Scripture is full of flawed redeemers. Moses was God's servant, but he disobeyed when he struck the rock in anger. David was God's chosen king, but his life descended into adultery and murder. Solomon was the true Davidic heir, but his old age brought with it mass infidelity and rank materialism. But then we have Jesus. Like Noah, he too had favor with God. After he emerged from the waters of John's baptism, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came upon him and the Father announced, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But Jesus would not fail in his designation as Redeemer. He experienced hell for his people. He rose from the dead in victory. He carried human nature into heaven in the ascension. And now he offers eternal life to all who come to him for mercy and enter the communion of his people even as Noah and his family boarded the ark. The creed says that this Jesus will return to judge the quick and the dead. And the Christian church has always believed this. Every day we should remind ourselves of the judgment to come, and this reminder should cause us to reflect on our own behavior. Are there things in our life that we would be ashamed to bring to God in the final judgment? But we also must remind ourselves of something else. The coming judge is our Redeemer and friend. He loves us so much that he gave up his own life to rescue us. Judgment in the end does not terrify the Christian, for Jesus is our rock and our life is tied up with his. Now there may be someone who listens to my words today who doesn't have this confidence that their life is tied up with Jesus, that they have boarded the ark, that they will stand in the judgment Maybe you're experiencing a season of dryness in your faith and that's why you have this failure of confidence. Or maybe you have never come to the point of personally confessing Christ as Savior and Lord and knowing that you're in a a relationship with Him. And the answer for either type of person, the person who's experiencing dryness or the person who just knows in their heart that they don't know Jesus, is to turn now to Jesus. Turn now to Jesus. Trust Him. Fall upon him and rest on him. Receive his love. If you do, the fear of judgment will soon be driven away by the deep perception of God's care for you. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your saving work that this great judgment fell upon you, but it fell upon you so that we might have eternal life. I pray, Father, that anyone who hears these words would um, just understand what Jesus has done in some fashion. I pray that you would uh, console those who are in a season of dryness, I pray that you would lead and convict those who do not know your Son. Lord, I pray you would be glorified. I pray you would send forth your Spirit to minister to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, thanks a lot, and I'll see you soon.